how does a virus infect a healthy organism? Once in, it may hide, it may mask itself to avoid the organism's autoimmune defenses. But to get in, it must find the weakest point and the right conditions. Time and place are important. Why did Christianity spread as it did, where it did, and when it did? Because it found Rome fatigued, decadent, soft. Still, it had to enter its political body through its weakest point, its slaves, its poor, its sickly, its degraded. Then it worked from the inside, manipulating human frailty, seducing by using human vanity, manipulating hope as the only antidote to fear. It did so delicately, using love, a variant of lust, to take advantage of the beast. On the same theme, how does the female's body accept a foreign element which, within itself, how are her uh, autoimmune defenses tricked? Here we find a fundamental aspect of female psychology and of the uh, instinct, the social instinct in general. In order for a female to be approached in the wild, overcoming her fight-flight mechanisms, lust must place her in a state of receptivity, a condition of risk-taking, of madness, in other words, irrationality. Chemicals are released in her brain, numbing her fear, repressing her desire to flee or to fight when the male is on top of her, inserting itself within her. This later develops into a social mechanism we associate with tolerance, and it's connected with the uh, chemical inebriation we know as love. This is why Christianity is synonymous with love, the, the psychology, the philosophy of love, and their God is is a synonym for love. This later develops into the social mechanism we associate with tolerance, like I said. Love is also a form of disassociation where the mind identifies with an otherness by focusing on the similarities and ignoring the differences. Later still, how does the male's spermatozoa become accepted by the female's body? Sometimes she reject, rejects them uh, intuitively, automatically. We call this chemistry, a connectivity or a sympathy, or a detachment, an antipathy caused by chemical parity or a lack of it. The sperm must be protected so as to do their job and fertilize the ovum. Her body, in other words, must be tricked and later the ensuing embryo must be protected so that she does not reject it as something alien to her. At least 50% of it is alien to her body. The embryo must appear to her, to her automatic defenses as something which is part of her. We have here a rudimentary form of love. Love on, a, on a, an organic level as this misidentification resulting in an attachment or or rather resulting in the repression of the more natural rejection and detachment. Attachment of course is also another way of saying uh, dependence and dependence is the opposite of independence and independence is another word for freedom. The relationship between meme and gene, which will also clarify what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a war like no other, can be compared uh, by using computer symbolism, computer uh, terminology. The meme is the software and the gene is the hardware. The gene hardware is important, is as important as the meme software which can be installed on it because it must uh, the meme must be uh, within its capacity to run otherwise it won't be able to uh, we can't install a meme which is beyond the hardware's capacity to uh, to use to run 
it is also possible to under underuse the potential of the hardware by installing it uh, by installing software which is far beneath its uh, capacities. Uniformity is programming all computers, all minds in other words, with the same program and disallowing all others. It's a uniformity of uh, programming. It's also the maintenance of mediocrity by making sure that no matter what the uh, level of the the hardware is, the software will never take full uh, advantage of it or will not exceed its lowest uh, manifestation. This is how the illusion of equality of equal potentials is established. This is the artificial form of parity. There's no need to deal with an army of men when all you have to do is infect their females, turn them into zombies, and wait for time to kill them off. They once used to fight over resources, including females. Now all they have to do is seduce the female, turn them against their men, and have time to be dirty work. The nihilist, cowardly sort, does not challenge himself to adapt, to better himself in relation to the world and others. He demands, he prays, he expects the world should be changed and adapt, adapted to meet his requirements and his needs. In this way, the nihilist unburdens himself from the responsibility and at the same time retains an object of scorn. The world for him is what is hated, what should be escaped if it cannot be altered. His faith may no longer be in beyond, in the beyond, in the other world, but uh, has now become this coming future, this coming utopia, where technologies compensate and correct what the world has determined. Our disconnection from nature exposes the culture's nihilistic bent. It detaches from reality rather than wanting to harmonize with it. We see this uh, not only in feminism, but with the MRAs, where for both technologies, techniques are supposed to uh, compensate for their own deficiencies. One wants to compensate for uh, their female deficiencies and bring them uh, up to par with that of a male's average potential. Whereas the other, the MRA, wants to use technology as a form of uh, escape of detachment, of remaining uh, childlike, forever playing, where everything is a game and uh, it doesn't really matter at all. The MRA self-hating nihilists rejoice at the thought of traditionalism, as they call it, being dead and buried. In this way, they expose an ignorance concerning history and its recurring cycles but it also exposes a deep resentment of all that made them possible. And their desire to, to bury the, the past, they indirectly express a death wish, a desire to bury themselves and everything that made them possible. A need to, to kill themselves, if not literally, then within fantastic illusions and sheltering cocoons, where only uh, what they prefer goes on living. There, like cow caterpillars, they will await their coming blooming into butterflies. Feminists dream of a coming world with uh, no men, or with men which are now nothing more than females with inverted penises. MR MRAs dream of a coming world where technologies and techniques will also help them, as they have with females, help them escape the risks and the costs of being a disposable male. Their resentment of females and how unfair they are is really a, a secret resentment of nature and how unfair she is. Feminists want to return to nature, but only for themselves, selectively, in other words. Males should still be restricted by rules and even up so that uh, they can even up the playing field and give them an equal chance. 
the mean steps in to level the playing field. MRAs, on the other hand, want an, want an escape from nature, total detachment from it, emancipation from the principles that make them feel insecure and inadequate, given feminist uh, sexual freedom, and the choice that uh, they can yield as a weapon now. They no longer want to be judged genetically, but to remain childlike, infantile. They want to play and to be gamers. They want to be loved for uh, who they are, in other words, as these cute little boys who are just doing what cute little boys do. Feminists and MRAs share the glee at the mere thought of paternalism's demise. Females because they no longer have to submit to the middlemen and the MRAs because they no longer have to compete to be those middlemen. In this war, mimetic war, words are weapons. The best way to deal with an enemy is to disarm him, to take away the words. Words are meant to refer to mental abstractions, to the perceived. There are ways to connect the noumenon with the phenomenon. Now, the word are, is detached from reality. It refers to the noumenon, the symbol symbolizing the abstraction in relation to another abstraction, not to the sensual. The word refers back to the mind. This is a form of solipsism, also known by uh, using uh, Baudrillard terminology as the simulation of a simulacrum lacrum, a self-closing world of unreality, a matrix of codes, lies, cocooning the brain and artificiality. Let us take as an example of the aforementioned, the political categories of conservative and progressive, to explore how nihilism and indoctrination has flip, flipped these terms on their heads. A conservative is associated with order. He wants to conserve order, in other words. A progressive wants to change. The delusion that change automatically means for the better is inherent in this line of thought because it is a direct descendant of Christian dogma. In Christianity, the negative of death is flipped into a positive as a coming eternal life. In liberalism, paradise has been transferred to the more earthly and imminent future. The negative of change, I will explain why it is a negative, is now a method bringing about the coming utopia. Change is good for change's sake. Why is change a negative in relation to life and the human condition? Well, first of all, life is an ordering and anything which changes uh, must be an affront to its order. This is why life, uh, life, the living organism, is in a perpetual state of stress. It, it's always in need. It's always correcting. It's always uh, in, a, well, as the ancient call it, agon, agonas, the fight for survival. If we take uh, cosmological insights as a starting point, then the arrow of time is a direction towards increasing entropy. Change, measured by time, is this increasing entropy. Entropy is another word for randomness, the absence of order, the negation of patterns. We feel, <clears throat> we feel change as need. Need is the sensation of change or of time passing. Need, when left unsatisfied, when it is not dealt with, dealt with becomes pain and what we call suffering. This is why life and suffering are identical, they're synonymous. Ergo, change is experienced as pain, suffering. Ordering the expenditure of energies towards order is felt as pleasure. Why do we feel pleasure when eating or when fucking? Because the practice is one promising a healing or of what entropy has done to us, healing of temporal attrition. And it is also a release of energies and a sudden attempt to grow, to create, procreate to establish order, to enact a new beginning. Also consider this, 
change happens whether we like it or not. Order, on the other hand, demands effort, a will, a struggle. Change happens without effort. Entropy is the status quo of existence, not the exception to the rule, but the rule itself. Now let us bring in the so-called progressiveness, or progressives, and their love of change. In essence, they are contrary to any efforts to resist change by ordering or by rejecting disordering. They are against any form of order. They are secretly nihilist, but they don't even know that it themselves sometimes. They are consider conservatives in the metaphysical sense and only claim uh, to and only claim to be rebels in the social sense. They want to conserve change because in their minds it brings about goodness or at the very least with change they hope to alter the circumstances of their own existence which they secretly and sometimes intuitively despise. There is uh, an underlying self-resentment here. Nietzsche's overman was the man who had overcome the resentment of his own temporality or his own feminine chaos. The man who said yes to chaos because it brought about the possibility of a dancing star to use his symbolisms. The man who had accepted and dominated his own femininity. Ironically, this is also what a true male is, not one who rejects his feminine side or who denies its existence, who hates it like the MRAs, but the one who embraces and knows it and understands it and through this understanding comes to control it. And control is another word for dominance. The man who accepts femininity, chaos, nature, but does not submit to it. There's a difference between acceptance and submission. Anarchists are also attracted to this destructive nature of change for the same reasons as liberals are in general. Anarchism is, after all, a branch of communist ideology because ideals, means, also branch out, as do genetic bloodlines or species. With uh, anarchists, the destruction of power is supposed to level the playing field to the point where they hope they will have a chance of coming up on top. Because, let's face it, there is no such thing as absolute anarchy, not unless you are thinking of absolute chaos. We see the connection here between communism, anarchy, liberalism, and nihilism. Why? Because anytime you have one or more organisms, self-organizing entities, in other words, willful entities, you will have a hierarchy established. A hierarchy, like all value judgments, is a relationship. It's a comparison. To return to, uh, to progressives and conservatives. Conservatives, whether you agree or not with the type of order they propose, are the true rebels. For they confront and reject entropy chaos and wish to establish or to return to a previous state of order. They are opposed, in other words, to the status quo of change. They are creative, procreative, and dreamers. This is uh, why also they are laughed at by uh, the feet and the feminine, because chaos will always overpower order, right? So the nobility of uh, the one trying to oppose chaos uh, can be easily ridiculed by those who uh, have surrendered to it. This is why they the types of order that uh, many of these conservatives, so-called conservatives, envision come in many varieties and eventually become schools of thought, ways of thinking, political movements, polit political ideologies, or what we call memes. Progressives, on the other hand, reject order because they hope that quite by chance and with no willful intervention by man, a hypocrisy in itself that perfect order, which they call harmony, will come about. They wish to conserve change, which happens even if they would not wish it to happen, and expose themselves as the true conservatives. The underlying thinking there is that the universe is somehow uh, inclined towards harmony. In other words, there's, there's a divine 
element to it. There's a divine uh, motive and spirit in it. And you can see here again the connection between these uh, secular humanists, these progressives, even though they're many times atheists, and Judeo-Christian dogma. They are hypocrites because unlike true nihilists, they mask their distaste for the world and for existence as it is. Uh, and they mask it under projected emotional bullshit. And they are also hypocrites because though they profess a dislike for eugenics, their entire philosophical foundation is one dependent on human interventions upon natural processes. This also exposes the hidden masculine agenda beneath their feigned feminine ways. Take gender as an example. Here the story goes that sexual roles are human inventions. Not that sexual roles evolved naturally and were then integrated into social constructs as gender roles, but that man conjured them up out of nothing. Because you see, only appearances are different and all are on the inside at least the same. This is the, this is the common theme with liberal thinking and with Christian thinking. They propose education, retraining, enforce, enforcing codes of conduct to bring about this authentic, quote-unquote, state of uniformity. In short, this is social engineering, which brings me to the other modern lie concerning appearances. We are to believe that appearances are insignificant, relying on the, uh, implying that the underlying principle of dualism is at play here which separates the mind and the body, binary thinking. Therefore, in another nihilistic twist, appearances are not manifestations of essence, of the past, in other words, but are not to be trusted at all as anything more than accidental and superficial. We are not to take our senses seriously, we are told by these self-haters, because the inside is what matters, the Kantian thing in itself, this Christian soul, the spirit that resides somewhere in the beyond where it cannot be measured, perceived, nor understood. Where, uh, when we see divergence, we are trained to disregard it because all is supposedly uniform in potential. When we see multiplicity, we are educated to dismiss it because all is one. We see here monism again, the common denominator in these nihilistic, uh, in this nihilistic dogma, which includes Marxism, socialism, secular humanism, uh, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, and so on, we we are trained to feel ashamed of judging on appearances or judging at all. We feel guilty, ashamed, as part of the indoctrinating Pavlovian sensation of nihilistic leveling. It is implied that the senses evolved to trick us, not to aid us in our survival. And what is guilt? An internal conflict between gene and meme, between the reversing lies of nihilism and our own aesthetic realism. A conflict between the modern world, a nulling ideal of modernity, and the life-affirming real. We are to feel ashamed and guilty when we see diversity and fail to not consider it as something worthless, as worthless sensual data. This is social eugenics at play. This is how the meme can supersede the gene, causing internal stress, sometimes to the point of psychological rupture. This only happens when the meme in question is so life-rejecting, so world and self-hating that it produces extreme internal psychological contradictions, forcing the mind to choose or to break. In fact, not only do appearances matter as manifestations of an entire becoming, a reflection of the past, but there is nothing more than the apparent. For the apparent to appear does not presuppose a complete perception of it, but it simply states that what exists is interactive and it appears as this interactivity only to a consciousness that has evolved the ability to perceive interactivity and to translate the divergences this interactivity produces into form, color, texture, smell, sound. Our senses are not accidental, nor, nor did they evolve to trick us. 
evidence of the importance of appearance is that even those who dismiss it as inconsequential, uh, inconsequential go to great distances to mask and to hide and to accentuate their own appearance. Science deals in the apparent, not the absolute. It uses the appearance, the sensually perceived, to deduce the nature of what appears and has failed to this day to find anything which hides beneath appearance. In other words, the indivis indivisible, the static, the unchanging, the uniform. No thing has been discovered, no absolute, only gradations, flows, activities, interpreted by a perceiving brain in ways that simplify and generalize them in ways that makes them comprehensible. The mind perceives patterns, in other words, and translates them into types.